Like to travel by train at 300 miles an hour? We may do in a few years' time. Forget about wheels, the hovercraft principle, with a train supported by an air cushion and skimming over a magnetic field at near aircraft speed, is a dream no longer. Raised on air, the hovercraft development model responds to the magnetic pull supplied by the alternating current on the track, inducing a current in the linear coils of the train itself. No need for a driver on the train. Control panels and a few computers could run a whole railway system. One snag, the capital cost of the electrified monorail would be enormous. It would come bang on a financial crisis, wouldn't it? We're here nestled amid the stanchions, or, which are the main artifacts of the, the former line of the experimenter hover train that went alongside the Bedford level ba barrier bank. We'll have experts with us today who will be able to describe it in detail, but it's part of our program in relationship to the used washes, which we term the archaeology of the Great Strait, uh, which is essentially the degree which the Bedford level was used as an experimental test bed, essentially because it's long and it's straight and it's flat. And because of that, it's attracted quite a lot of science. In the 17th century, Charles II asked the Royal Society, for example, to use it as a basis to measure a meridian of the globe. On Last year, um, as part of the Use Washes program, we uh, tried to reenact some of Rowell Bottom's uh, flat earth trials which were also taking place along the level essentially for the same reasons because it was long and it's straight. My name's Eddie Edwards and I'm interested in the hover train and the story of how it uh, came about and how it uh, went through its final demise. The first I, I knew I heard about this whole thing was when I was looking on some Google satellite maps uh, three years ago and I saw three little lumps uh, surrounded by water in this kink in the river and it looked interesting and I couldn't find anyone on the internet who could describe them apart from saying this is all that remains of the 1970s hover train experiments and I came down to have a look and I thought well yes there's three nice big concrete blocks two of them are about 70 -ish feet apart then there's a huge gap to the next one and I couldn't envisage how anyone could move um, a lump of concrete 140 feet long uh, through the fens and put it on in position. So I reckon there just had to be a fourth place, the missing pier. And uh, uh, later on, I engaged the help of Chris Holly, who's another local historian, and we went down and we kicked around and we eventually found where the piers were, but they weren't where we were expecting them to be because we were measuring 75 feet from the other two piers and where we hoped to find two more of these things, the, the piles. And they weren't because they had put four pile caps down in a square rather than simply two. And they were not 75 feet apart. We don't know what that signifies, um, apart from the fact they'd had a problem. It doesn't look as though they've put concrete piers onto the piles. But basically what they did was to build a concrete beam structure uh, with beams weighing 50 tonnes, 75 feet long, and about seven or eight feet high and six feet wide. And they bolted them together. And on that they run uh, a superb piece of engineering with uh, a motor that was driven by a linear induction motor and the air cushion uh, to give it um, suspension from the, from the track, which is where the whole craft principle and names come from. Uh, later on it, the idea was that the linear motor would not only do the propulsion backwards and forwards, but also give the, the lift above the ground. And they had models in which they'd done that, but it never got to the fruition of the, of the train itself. Um, the train weighed about 22 tonnes. It managed to get to 107 miles an hour in a one mile uh, stretch from start to finish, which pretty well proved that the, the science was there, ready to expand. And unfortunately, because of government cuts, uh, the usual budget problems, the whole project was cancelled by Michael Heseltine. We've got a photograph of the train arriving from uh, Vickers in Swindon. Um, I was told they knocked the part of the pub down to get the big beams in because the beams were 75 feet long and that had to turn from a narrow high street in Erith into an equally narrow turning to come up to here. It's now marked by a piece of 
grass and a, a village sign and a bench. When, when you see the photograph of the, of the train coming in, the, the towing unit goes right across where the pub was on the grass and the back end just about manages to, manage to uh, miss the edge. And there's a police car each end of the convoy, this train, a nice Woolsey, black Woolsey in the front with a bell in the front, which you can see, and it was followed by a little blue panda car at the back, and they took it all the way from Swindon to here. We're actually at the side of the, the old hangar works. I think it was 6,000 square feet. And from the front, you can see, because of the colours of the gable wall, uh, you can see where the old hangar was. It's been extended both sides and also at the back very considerably. But the inside, you can see where the doors used to be, where the hover train was wheeled out. And it was then lifted up, this whole 22-ton uh, machine lifted up on a gantry and placed on top of the, the concrete beams. The way they built the track was actually very interesting because they called it uh, their own innovative idea. But they put one beam uh, onto two supports on each end and then another beam was placed on top of the first and pushed along and it used to hang in mid-air somewhere supported by various ropes and gantries and cranes and then the second one would be lowered in position uh, onto a, a third pier and then so on and so they built this uh, what they call the, uh, the beam over beam construction um, and it was very it was necessary because the the gap the distance between the old Bedford bank on one side of the work site and the counter drain on the other in places is as little as 15 feet and they had to allow access for vans and cars to go up and also build the uh, first of all, to drive the piles down into the fen, fen soil and then to build the concrete on top of that. And they did it in two stages. They started, first of all, from where we are at Erith and went about a mile and a quarter and that was sufficient at low level and that was sufficient for their test drive. Um, and then they started at the Sutton Golf Ends, um, which is three miles from here, and they started to build a high level track which wasn't all that successful because it fell down. And one of the foremen working on the site saw the beam and gave the shout, but it was too late, they came tumbling down. Here we are in, uh, in Peterborough, in Cambridgeshire, and it's ironic really that this RTV, this research test vehicle 31, is right alongside the East Coast Main Line. And if you are heading north and you look on your left-hand side towards the westerly direction, you'll see RTV there on the plinth. Well, to be honest, why is RTV here? It all happened really in the early 90s and uh, somebody, a volunteer from the Neen Valley Railway I believe, told Richard Payton that he'd seen RTV at a uh, Cranwell, Cranwell Airfield in Bedfordshire and uh, they were going to clear the airfield and it was going to be scrapped. They got uh, together a team from the Tract Hovercraft Limited and they raised about £5,600 I think it was to actually move it from Cranfield and bring it to Peterborough. It was a heck of an experience bringing it here because um, they could not get it into our site. They had to knock a wall down in the end. Four cranes from Peterborough Crane Hire lifted it up. Um, there was two cranes lifting the beam one end, another crane lifting the beam the other end, and a third crane was actually lifting our TV31 up. So many of our visitors over the years say that they remember it. My friend actually, who lives opposite me, we got talking about it one day and he's 99. <laughs> and he said, I remember that going along the, the track in Erith. He said it used to be sparks everywhere. And he said they had to get special permission from Bedford level from the Central Electricity Generating Board to switch it on. And they used to switch it on at something like 3.15 in the afternoon because that was a low period, whether it was when all the factories were having a tea break or not, I don't know. But uh, he said it, and there was all sparks coming out of it when he went along. And somebody else told me that they, they had the hook down. They tried it one day with the hook. And, and they said there was sparks everywhere and, and this. You know, it's a bit like aircraft landing on, a, on an aircraft carrier. You know, the, the rope, whoosh, because there was no means of stopping it if it had shot off the end. So that's why they put this uh, arrestor wire on it. Now, my personal interest in terms of the hover train started when we did the work at Haddam in the 1980s down in the Upper Delfts, because there, there were aerial photographs showing the line of the, uh, the hover train 
um, which looked very incongruous at the time he wondered what it is. Our particular interest was that you can also see the tops of Bronze Age barrows sticking out the top of it. Um, so they formed a really quite extraordinary juxtaposition. The other thing was almost personally in terms of an interest is that on one hand, such modes of transportation, particularly monorails, have a long legacy. They were on the continent, they started building them in the late 19th century. But when I grew up in the 1960s, there was a real boom for them because the whole constructions of monorails, something that focused on world's fairs, Disneyland had them, many cities had proposals for them, including Toronto, where, where I grew up in. It was an absolute sense of the announcement of the future, the sense of this is the future we can anticipate. Um, so in a way, these, especially these stanchions strike you as sort of odd relics of what the future was meant to be, um, and almost leave you a sense of the nostalgia for the future, because let's face it, the, um, again, a hallmark of the time, Kubrick's 2001, when you finally got the 2001, the future wasn't really quite as great as it was hoped to be, and these things are, are evocative of it. We were talking about the legacy earlier on, but one of the tragedies of the whole scheme was for the staff. Uh, dedicated teams of scientists had worked on this for many years, developing all the various scientific and the civil engineering aspects of the whole project. And they achieved their goal by uh, making the train go above 100 miles an hour on a 1.2 miles uh, track. That was from start to finish, and in between they managed 100 miles an hour. Fantastic, everyone was jumping around, joy. A week later, the government cut the money funds and there was devastation. Everyone was made redundant. And I understand that the, an eight-man team that was on one part of the scientific um, project decided that the UK was no longer for them and they emigrated to, to, uh, to Canada en masse. Do you want to tell us how you, how you found it? Well, my father-in-law, Ken, died in uh, 2003 and um, soon after he died we, we um, had full access and permission to go into his shed and I found what I thought was a tin chest covered in cobwebs and I looked inside to see that it was very mouse-eaten but it c contained some very important documents on the hovercraft or the hover train and it, it's been a worry ever since. What am I going to do with those? So when I saw um, this lecture coming up on on, uh, on a Facebook website, Mike Petty's Facebook website, I thought, ah, oh, somebody's interested. I must get that chest out and I must uh, pass it all on. And I had the permission of Ken's wife, uh, my mother-in-law and the rest of the family to do that. And we're all really, really happy that um, this information is going to be preserved forever. And if anyone's got the time, Elizabeth, to go through them, they will find that there's a whole history here of all the instructions that were sent from every department within Track Hovercraft Limited to Ken. Ken was in charge of the workshop um, at uh, Didn't Walk 